ever wonder what cutting edge management looked like um, back in the 80s, we're diving into a real time capsule of a document, a 1982 white paper from Motorola on, get this, participative management. It's so fascinating to get a peek behind the curtain, you know, to see how a tech giant like that was grappling with these ideas. This was Motorola at a kind of a pivotal moment, a company known for its innovation, but also facing this changing competitive landscape. Exactly. And our guide for this deep dive is Guy Wallace, a training supervisor at their training and education center. He's the one who wrote this paper, Participative Management of the Performance System, to try to tackle some real challenges they were facing. And what's striking is how relevant some of these challenges still are, even today. We're talking about the the really practical stuff, like how do you actually make participated management work? How do you make it more than just, you know, a buzzword? Right. They had this program, PMP, aiming to, like, supercharge productivity and quality by getting everyone involved. Yeah. Setting goals together, brainstorming solutions, the whole nine yards. They even tied bonuses to improvements. You'd think that'd be a home run. You'd think so, wouldn't you? But uh, Wallace points to this crucial missing piece, skills training, practical skills training. They had that like the rah, rah, let's do this part down, but not enough of the here's how W to collaborate effectively. It's like announcing a potluck, but forgetting to tell anyone to bring serving utensils. Yeah, exactly. All enthusiasm, no execution. He specifically calls out process skills. Teamwork, communication, problem solving, all those things that don't just magically appear just because you suddenly say, all right, everybody, participate. It does make you wonder how they thought that would work. But um, that sounds like there were other roadblocks, too, not just the skills gap. What other things were they bumping into? Well, Wallace points to some deep-rooted misconceptions about participative management that were kind of brewing. Like, some managers were really terrified of losing authority, you know, as if it was, like, my way or the highway or total anarchy with no in-between. Ah, uh, yes, the classic control freak manager. Yeah. Threatened by the thought of their team actually, you know, having a voice. Exactly. And And get this, on the flip side, some employees felt like their input was just disappearing into a black hole. Which seems kind of ironic, given what the program was supposed to be about. So much for feeling heard and valued. What a mess. It really was. Did did the bonus structure help at all? Well, that's the thing. It was supposed to be this big incentive, but it seems like it might have backfired in a way. Wallace observed that the focus shifted from genuine quality improvement to just chasing the bonus, which led to this kind of like unhealthy end of month scramble every month. So instead of a collaborative quality focused environment, it just turned into a win at all costs kind of frenzy. Unfortunately, yeah, it seems like it did. It seems like they were losing sight of the initial goal to try to get things back on track. Wallace proposed this this more holistic framework something he called the uh, performance systems approach. Performance systems. Okay. That sounds interesting, but also a little vague. Can you break that down for us? Sure. So instead of getting bogged down in all these isolated problems, you know, just Mm -hmm. kind of attacking things piecemeal, you zoom out, you look at the bigger picture and how everything impacts performance as a whole. Okay. I'm listening. So imagine like a triangle, right? And each corner is something different. One corner is quality, another is quantity, and the last one is cost. And then productivity, that's in the middle. It's the link between the quantity and the cost. So you're saying it's about understanding how all these things, how all these pieces fit together. That makes sense, especially with a company as big and complex as Motorola, right? Exactly. And this approach, this performance systems approach, it helps you see where the system is weak. You know, where are the weak points? And then you can compare that to how it should be to kind of an ideal state and then figure out what needs to change. And when you say figure out what needs to change, What does that actually mean? What are you actually doing? Well, Wallace actually gives some concrete examples. Redesigning jobs, for one, or making Uh sure people have the right tools and resources. Maybe it's implementing new training or or tweaking the consequences, the reward and punishment systems, or even just creating feedback loops. So it's about really looking at the whole picture, right? Like all the elements, the people, the processes, the tools, everything. And then you try to adjust those things, fine tune them to improve how everything functions overall. You nailed it. And and to really illustrate this, Wallace introduces this model he calls if the SPRC-FB model. And it's really helpful, I think. The SPRC-FB model. Okay, that's a mouthful. What does that even stand for? It stands for Situation Performer Response Consequences Feedback. And he actually uses a flow chart to try to visually represent it in the paper, which I think is helpful for understanding how these elements all work together. Flow charts, gotta love them. <laughs> but... Uh, 
Hopefully this one's a bit more insightful than your average corporate PowerPoint, right? Definitely. So you start with the situation. That's the context, the environment where the work's happening. Then you've got the performer. That's the person or team actually doing the work. And then you look at the response required. What are the specific actions that need to happen in that situation to be successful? Then come the consequences, both the good and the bad, the positive and negative that result from those actions. And then finally, you have feedback on the response, on what they did, which then informs future actions and hopefully better performance. So it's basically this step-by-step -step analysis, right, of the entire performance cycle mm -hmm. from the initial setup and context all the way to the feedback at the end. Right. And I think this ties into a really key idea that Wallace highlights. A lot of times the problems aren't because of the individual, but because of the environment they're in. Things like unclear expectations, lack of proper training. Maybe the consequences aren't appropriate. It's what he calls task interference. It's that old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but if you don't give him the right bucket, it's not going to work out so well. Exactly. This is fascinating stuff. Yeah. But I know there's more to unpack, right? Like, what about different management styles. How do those factor into this whole thing? You're right on track. Wallace actually brings in research from the Huthwaite Research Group, and they identified two distinct management styles, push and pull. Okay, help me visualize this. Am I picturing a manager literally pushing and pulling something? I love the image, but in this case, no. Push refers to a more autocratic style, very directive, you know, the type that gives tons of information, lots of proposals, but doesn't spend as much time trying to get information from their team. They don't really check for understanding or work on building consensus as much. It's the classic kind of top-down approach. So push is about telling people what to do, not necessarily inviting them to share their thoughts and ideas. Pretty much. Okay, got it. What about pull then? Pull is more participative. Yeah. It's all about drawing ideas and insights out of the team, asking lots of questions, really trying to understand everyone's perspective, and then building that shared understanding together. So two very different approaches. Which one did Wallace say was better? That's the interesting part. He actually says that neither one is inherently better than the other. He says it's all about being adaptable. Effective managers, he argues, can adjust their style depending on the situation. He even quotes John Carlyle from the Huckweight Group, who said that having both push and pull tools in your, you know, your management toolbox essentially makes you a more effective leader overall. So it's not an either or situation, but more about knowing when to push and when to pull, depending on what's going on. Exactly. Did um, did Motorola actually end up using these models, these push and pull styles? in their training programs. They did. Wallace mentions that they used them in their interpersonal skills training and their sales call dimension programs. And they were even working on a negotiations program that used these same ideas. And, and it wasn't just Motorola. Xerox was using these models too. Wow, that's really interesting. It's like getting this little glimpse into how management training was evolving back then. Okay, before we move on to the next part, you mentioned that Wallace made a connection between participative management and those performance systems you were talking about earlier. Yes. He makes the point that while they're definitely different concepts, they actually share a common philosophical foundation. So they're different but share the same DNA in a way. Exactly. It all boils down to some basic beliefs about what motivates people at work. First off, people need to know how to do their job well. That might seem obvious. Right. You can't expect someone to perform well if they haven't been given the right training or support. Exactly. Second, people generally want to do good work. They really do. But the consequences, good or bad, are going to shape how they behave. It's that classic carrot and stick approach we always hear about. Sure, but it's more nuanced than that. It's not just about rewards and punishments. It's about creating a culture where good work is recognized and appreciated and where people feel safe to make mistakes and learn from them. So creating a culture where people feel supported, not like they're walking on eggshells all the time. Right. And this leads to the third thing they share. People work best, they thrive, in an environment where they know what's expected of them, where the standards are clear, and where they're getting regular feedback. That makes a lot of sense. It sounds like creating that kind of environment w with those three elements would be essential for both participative management and the performance systems approach to really work. Absolutely. But let's shift gears for a second. We've talked a lot about the theory, but I'm curious, how did Motorola actually put these ideas into practice? Yeah, let's dive into that. 
It's one thing to talk about it, but another thing to actually make it happen. Right. And it's important to remember that Motorola was already pretty on board with this whole participative management thing. They already had the PMP program up and running with the whole committee structure and everything. So they had the structure in place, but they needed the tools to actually make it work the way they wanted it to. Exactly. So they brought in the performance systems approach. They started incorporating those push and pull management styles. And they also started using statistical quality tools. It was all part of creating this more effective system system. We talked about those statistical quality tools earlier. Didn't Wallace have some reservations about them? Something about oversimplifying. He did. He uses this analogy that I think really illustrates his point. Imagine you take your car to the mechanic because it's making a weird noise. Mm, I know where this is going. Instead of actually taking the time to figure out what's wrong, the mechanic just starts checking your tire pressure and your fluids, all the routine stuff. Treating the symptoms without addressing the root cause. Mm -hmm. I've been there. Right, and that's what Wallace was getting at. He relates this back to Duran's idea of a diagnostic journey. It's a much more deliberate, methodical approach to problem solving. You don't just jump in with solutions. You take the time to really understand the problem, figure out what's causing it, come up with a targeted solution. And then, of course, you have to implement that solution and see if it actually works. So you're saying it's just as important to understand the why behind a problem as it is to have the tools to fix it. Exactly. It's about being thoughtful and strategic, not just throwing things at the wall to see what sticks. That makes a lot of sense. So we've talked about the theory. We've talked about some of the tools they use. Now I want to know, how did this PMP program at Motorola actually work in practice? What did it look like day to day? Picture this. Information is constantly flowing up and down throughout the entire organization. We'll call it an upward flow and a downward flow. Okay, I'm picturing it. Kinda. Tell me more. <laughs> so the upward flow is all about employees being able to share their thoughts and ideas. They could offer suggestions for improvement, give feedback on what was working and what wasn't, that kind of thing. The important thing was that people on the front lines, the ones actually doing the work, had a voice and were being heard. That's interesting. And what about this downward flow? That's where the management side comes in. Downward flow was about communicating the company's goals and strategies, making sure everyone was clear on the overall plan. It was also about sharing expectations, setting standards, and giving feedback on individual and team performance. So a continuous loop, basically, with information and feedback flowing both ways to make sure everyone's on the same page and working towards the same goals. Exactly. And those committees we talked about earlier, they played a key role in making this whole system work. Right. The committees, we <laughs> talked about all those different levels, group, sector, corporate, business center. It's a lot to keep track of. It is, isn't it? Each level had a specific role to play in making this two-way communication system actually function. Okay, remind me again who was responsible for what. Sure. So at the very top, you had the group sector slash corporate committees. They were the big picture thinkers. They were responsible for setting the overall direction, you know, figuring out the company-wide goals, strategies, and plans. They also played a big role in getting resources for the program and figuring out the whole incentive system. Okay, so they were steering the ship basically. What about those business center committees? Think of them as the translators. They took those big picture ideas and figured out how to make them work in their specific business unit. They'd allocate resources, set priorities for their team, and really just make sure that things moved from the planning phase to actually getting done. So they were the bridge between the big ideas and the day-to-day -day work. Exactly. Then you had the functional operational steering committees. They were the specialists, the ones who really knew the ins and outs of their particular area. They'd analyze how things were working, identify any weak spots, and then come up with solutions. Like a team of troubleshooters zeroing in on the areas that needed the most attention. That's a good way to put it. And lastly, you have the working committees. They were the ones on the ground in the trenches. They were responsible for actually implementing those solutions and then providing feedback on whether or not they worked. Wow. So everyone really did have a role to play from the top level planning all the way down to actually making the changes. But I'm curious, what about the people on these committees? What skills did they need to be effective? That's a great question. And the answer is, it depended. It really depended on the specific role in the project they were working on. Some people might have needed a deeper understanding of the performance systems approach, while others might have needed expertise in data analysis. And then there were the universal skills. Communication, teamwork, problem solving. It really ran the gamut. So a pretty diverse set of skills needed. It wasn't just a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. 
Exactly. But there's a really important point that Wallace emphasizes throughout the paper. Even with all these added responsibilities, everyone's primary job was still their day-to-day -day work. The committee work was meant to be an additional layer, not a replacement for everything else they were doing. So it was about finding that balance. You want people to be engaged and contribute, but you don't want to overload them with extra work. Absolutely. It's about working smarter, not just harder, right? Definitely. All this talk about structure and processes and committees, it makes you wonder, what was the ultimate goal of all this? What was Wallace hoping to achieve with Motorola's PMP program? Well, he talks about this in the conclusion of the paper. He envisioned revisiting the program through the lens of a performance analyst. He challenged Motorola to imagine their ideal system to define what success would actually look like. He emphasized how important it was to set clear expectations, provide the necessary resources, establish clear consequences, and create effective feedback systems, all these things working together. So it was about constantly evaluating and evolving, not just setting up the program and then forgetting about it. You got it. He wanted Motorola to have the tools and the mindset to really maximize the potential of participative management, to boost quality, to improve productivity, to create a better work environment overall. It's amazing how much thought and effort went into this program back then. But the big question is, does any of this stuff still hold up in 2024? I mean, it's been over 40 years. You know, it really is remarkable how much of what Wallace talked about still resonates today. Those challenges of implementing participative management, that need for clear communication and good training, understanding that you need to take a holistic approach to performance, those are all still so relevant. It's like no matter how much technology changes or how much the business world changes, we're still dealing with the same fundamental human elements. Exactly. And I think that's what makes this white paper, even though it's from 1982, so valuable. It gives us a framework for how to engage employees and create a more productive work environment. And those things are timeless. You know, for me, that SPR CFB model really stuck with me. It's such a simple but powerful tool. And it's not just for the workplace either. I can see how you could use it in your personal life too. Absolutely. It makes you pause before you jump to conclusions about why someone's not performing well. It forces you to ask, okay, what was the situation? Did they have what they needed to succeed? What were the consequences of their actions? Did they get any feedback? It's like a reminder to be more understanding, you know, mm -hmm. more analytical, more empathetic. Exactly. Well, on that note, I think we've covered a lot of ground today. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? I think the biggest takeaway here is that even a document from 40 years ago can still offer valuable insights into how to create a more productive and engaging workplace. And who knows, maybe it can even help us navigate those tricky interpersonal situations in our personal lives too. Well said. That's what I love about these deep dives. You never know what you're going to uncover or where it's going to lead. That's all the time we have for today. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep those performance systems humming. Mm -hmm.